On our phone lines now, Grego, we are joined by an absolute legend in the fight game. You likely best know him for his boxing analysis on Showtime's championship boxing. A longtime newspaper man, author of the book, 30 Years, 30 uh, Undeniable Truths About Boxing, Sports, and Television, an accredited actor, and a musician with two albums and performances up and down the Las Vegas strips. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the great <laughs> Al Bernstein. Al, how are you doing, my friend? I'm good. With that introduction, I, I feel... Uh... Uh, odd. <laughs> you made me sound a lot better than I am. Man, we're the ones that odd. I didn't even know about the musician stuff until I started researching you. And man, that's amazing. Yeah, I just did a show um, the other night, uh, last Friday, uh, in at the Tuscany Hotel and Casino. We did a music show. So it was. Uh, Georgia, Georgia. Man, that's amazing. Darren? Oh, he's a, a living legend, that's for sure. And uh, I even made my wife listen to uh, it. Was it is it Kenny Davidson? Is that your guy? Yeah, that you, that's uh, where we go to yep. do the music. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Well, of course, we're on limited time with you, and thank you for uh, gracing us with your presence. So we're going to jump into it. First of all, the w boxing world is still buzzing over the Fury Wilder three fight, and I believe you were in the building. You didn't call it, uh, so you yeah. actually got to go as a fan, which has got to yeah. be a treat for you. What were your thoughts and takeaways of that real quick before you do a Tommy Morrison spectacular show deep dive? Yeah, you know, um, it was amazing, uh, and it was fun because I was just watching it. I didn't have to do anything. I wasn't involved in the coverage, and um, it was – you know, an extraordinary night on every level. Uh, and I was privileged to do their first fight, which was very good. That was the one in which, uh, of course, Wilder um, had Fury down twice. He got up. I mean, <laughs> excuse me. Let's listen. He, yeah, thank you. He got up amazingly and uh, uh, survived. And uh, it was a controversial draw. And then the second fight dominated by Fury. This one... You know, it's interesting. Tyson Fury was on the edge of starting to dominate this fight when that right hand landed by Fury. Uh, yeah. You know, he and, and part of the reason it landed is because Tyson Fury forgot the basic tenet of what he does, which is if you're everything you do is predicated on the jab. He didn't jab his way in. He just bull rushed his way in. And that right hand found him. And we heard um, his trainer, um, uh, Sugar Hill, remind him in the middle of the fight, you have to use your jab. And when he did use the jab, he controlled a Wilder. But it was an extraordinary event, a, a tremendous fight. And uh, I think punctuates what has been, even though boxing's had it, also hits, <clears throat> as all, it always does, it's uh, not so perfect stories this year. Uh, I think the product boxing's put on this year has been spectacular, and I thought that fight kind of punctuated. 100%. Yeah, I thought uh, Malik Scott, uh, Wilder's trainer, had a very good strategy. The first two rounds, he was working the jab, going to the body. He looked different, and then all of a sudden, he reverted back to his old ways and kind of, you know, the size advantage and uh, or disadvantage for him uh, was the ultimate demise. But he's got that, that one knock, you know, that huge power, and, that bailed him out for a little bit, but well, he took a beating in that fight, but I respect him for going through with that. And uh, that was a fun trilogy and it's still got the boxing world buzzing, but without further ado, it is time to do a deep dive into Tommy. Uh, you're a man that was with top rank boxing for a long time and did, I can't even remember how many Tommy Morrison fights you did. Of course I was glued to the TV and I was fortunate to go see Tommy fight many times in person. What was your, uh, takeaways of the Tommy's careers as far as up and downs and I know his story's been well documented we're, we're going to give it a little fresh angle but uh, what was your takeaway on Tommy's uh, up and downs on his careers and uh, your interactions with him well first I always enjoyed interacting with Tommy um, I he was one of the most uh, cooperative uh, easy to deal with fighters. Most fighters are actually, people don't realize that, but uh, he, he was uh, a delight to deal with. And, you know, whatever Tommy's demons that ended up, you know, uh, being difficult for him, uh, 
he was a professional, you know, uh, and uh, and doing his fights was fun because he was involved in a lot of interesting fights, to be sure. I mean, I did, you know, a number of Tommy, uh, Tommy Morrison fights when he was on the ESPN top rank uh, show including the crazy night in which he fought Tim Tomaszek when Tim Tomaszek <laughs> came out of the stands uh, and fought him that night because I think um, <laughs> Mike Williams, I think, was the fighter who decided to leave the building uh, on the night of the fight. He just said, I'm leaving. Um, and then it, it was, was either he didn't want to take a drug test or his yeah, back allegedly just, acted up or something. He's like, I'm he out. Was gone. <laughs> See you later. And Tomaszek came in. So I did a lot of Tommy's fights and it was – it was a, it was always a joy dealing with him. One of the questions I have is uh, one of his less than stellar nights. He fought Ross Purity to a draw where Tommy was down twice. And unfortunately, ESPN ran out, of, ran out of time, so we didn't get an interview afterwards. Were you able to interview Tommy after that fight just to see what was going on? If you if you recall that, because I was always I didn't, curious. I didn't interview him. We didn't do an actual interview with him because we went off the air. And back then, you know, uh, they weren't like cooperating with Sports Center, and the remote people weren't in sync like they are now. And to get an interview and then put it on somewhere, uh, so we never did. Um, I think we talked to him afterwards, and he just was it was an off night for him. You know, he just. Uh, didn't feel right physically, um, and it, he just underperformed. I still had him winning a fight, I believe, 96-94, even with those two knockdowns. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, he, did, he just uh, – I don't know if he trained. Uh, well, the other, the other interesting thing is Ross <laughs> Purity was the guy who gave a lot of top heavyweights problems. You know, he, Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he wasn't – he didn't become a champion or anything of that nature, but he, he beat a, Klitschko. a number. Pardon <laughs> He beat a Klitschko. He did beat a Klitschko, and there aren't too many people that can make that claim. That's for sure. Well, one of, one of my other working Tommy theories that uh, my uh, Tommy uh, Morrison fans wanted to ask you was, it seemed like after the Foreman fight, when he changed the style to, to uh, box, what he had to do against Foreman, because he can't, he can't stand in front of Foreman, he never really got back to that aggressive, gunslinging mentality like you saw with the Ross Tuckers and the, the Camille Odoms and and uh, it, he never really got back to that. And that seemed to hinder him as his career went on. Do you think there's any substance to that or just? I don't know. Maybe a little. I mean, I think that the Foreman fight, they devised that plan because they said this is, and which was surprising and shocking to everybody. Nobody thought, who knew Tommy Morrison could do that for, for 12 rounds. Uh, and he did. Um, and maybe it made it, maybe he was more, maybe the, the, the more, de, the more measured style that he, of that hurt him in the, after that, I don't know. Um, you know, he still had good moments and, uh, and I think the fights he lost, you know, things like the fight to Lewis and, um, of course the, now the bent fight, bent loss had come before, was that before or after Foreman? I forgot. That was his second fight after uh, for me. I drove seven hours uh, from Austin, Texas to yeah. Tulsa with my dad to see that. And it, and now, my dad, in, that uh, one, in that one, he did attack. And, of course, he had Bent in trouble. In a way, he over-attacked, right? Because <laughs> Bent was able to land the counterpunch that would hurt him. So there were still aggressive moments for me. If anything, maybe that was the fight that, that made him more, uh, you know, less uh, uh, more defensive. But, you know, I – it's hard to tell what, you know, what, what led him to be not quite the attacker that he had been. One of the, uh, I guess my analysis of Tommy was that, you know, when he stepped up against Ray Mercer for three rounds, he looked like one of the best heavyweights on the planet. Oh yeah. And then, you know, the razor Ruddick, obviously you, you and I were there, obviously you called the fight, just a legendary right. event. But when he stepped up against Lennox Lewis, then it clearly showed to me as painful as it was that, hey, he was a, you know, a heck of a fighter, a fun fighter, a second tier heavyweight. But as you were quoted on the 30 for 30, it was a very vibrant time for the heavyweight division. And, Lenny, you know, the, I, I talked to Tommy Burgett's, uh post uh, early 2000s about the, 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 the attack. But the plan was to go after Lennox Lewis like they did against Ray Mercer. And he could never get it going. And I was always depressed about that. But then you look back and realize that, Lewis was a, a you know a top five heavyweight of all time, 
and right. just used the jab and kept Tommy at bay and Tommy had no head movement. And, and that pretty much summarizes his career. You know, he was a, a second tier, exciting rock star heavyweight, but he was never going to be able to have sustained success. Do you feel that's an accurate statement? Yeah, to a point, you know, I listen, he was a good fighter, really good fighter, you know, and the losses he had, there were reasons for the most in most cases. I mean, the Michael Bent thing was kind of an aberration because he got hit with something and, he, you know, just, that one's that one's the hardest to explain. The Ray Mercer loss, simple to explain. Ray Mercer at that time had the greatest chin in boxing <laughs> and and Tommy Morrison hit him with everything. But Ray Mercer was able to hurt him. Um, the Lewis loss, again, explainable because Lennox Lewis and I do think he's one of the top five heavyweights of all time. His his physical dimensions and the way he fought did not mesh well for what Tommy wanted to do. Uh, and and it was a hard, you know, a, a very hard fight for him. So, you know, you look at the, the fights that he, he didn't fare well in and you can kind of understand why they happened. But but at, we saw him beat other good, really good heavyweights. And it was um and, you know, the he was an excellent fighter, just an excellent fighter. And, you know, in in any era would have been a really good heavyweight contender. And, and you know, in the in an era of many championships could have, you know, certainly he did briefly have a version of the world championship, um, could have had a, a title at any time. Well, I always you- cling to the contention that if Tommy had beaten Bent and they fought in March of uh, – Lewis and, uh, was a March of 94 at the MGM Grand that was supposed to happen, and Pepe Correa was still Lewis's trainer, I would have given Tommy a heck of a chance to win that because Lewis didn't have yeah. the footwork at that time. Absolutely. And then Emmanuel Stewart right. comes that- along and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> I agree. And that to me, that's kind of indicative of also the star-crossed life that Tommy had, you know. Many times it just was a perfect storm of of timing, you know, and that lost event, which nobody expected, uh, was uh, was a killer for his career. And, you know, that you're right. That was the Lewis trained by Pepe Correa. He had not yet become the fighter that Emmanuel Stewart would make him. And that would have been a very interesting fight to be sure and Tommy would have had a better chance to win Absolutely. did you have interaction with him on when you guys were on the set of Rocky 5 like oh, so Tommy out, outside of the boxing world like how was he just as, you know how was he on the set how was he just as a person like that let me tell you two, two things about Tommy Morrison in that movie number one he, listen he had never been in a movie before right he right. had a starring role in this movie he had tons of dialogue he was, I'm not saying he was Robert De Niro or, or, <laughs> or you know, or Matt Damon. However, he, in the scenes I did that he was in and the times I saw him on the set in other scenes, he never messed up. You know, in movies, you have to redo sh- uh, shots over and over again. Okay. He never caused a, 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 a stoppage in the cut. He, he knew every line. He delivered them the same way every time. Did wow. not, there was not an up and down in his, in his uh, performance. Tommy Morrison was professional. Every single human on that movie respected him, and he did his job. And I believe that ha- under that among the many missed opportunities in Tommy Morrison's career, acting was one of them. Uh, there is no reason why, you know, he, he unfortunately, he lost two other careers, broadcasting because of it, personal issues. You know, he was he started to do broadcasting, which I think he would have been excellent at, mm-hmm. and the movies. He could have been an action movie guy. I mean, Absolutely. there's no question about that. Um, it's just a shame because those opportunities were there for him. And watching him in that Rocky film, I, I, to me, it's remarkable that a guy that never was in a movie did the job he did in that film. Amazing. It, it, Rocky Five gets panned by everyone. I think it's a very realistic boxing movie. You, you got the the Don King figure, the you know the rising up and coming contender, and 
I mean, you, you can say what you want about the script, but I actually enjoyed the movie. I don't bash it at all. Yeah, listen, it was it, it was it's not one of the jewels of the of the Rocky series, presumably, but I don't think it was a terrible movie. And I personally think it was the best of the Rocky movies because it was the only one I was in. Exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> that, that one had the great yeah. Albert. So clearly, <laughs> clearly it was the best one that was made. Absolutely. You should have gotten an Oscar nomination, sir. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, yeah. My brief scene. You know, it's funny. I wasn't even, I was supposed to do announce the fights, uh, but I, I went there and I couldn't, they had to delay doing the fight scenes and I couldn't come back to do it. So they oh. knew that was the case. So they threw me in that scene with the press conference just because they, I was there and they wanted to put me in the movie. So uh, <laughs> I wasn't even supposed to be in that scene. So I could have been, not seen at all. And the funny thing is, just a, an FYI, a week ago, I got yet another residual check from Rockies for $152. Yes. Hey. About Man. every three months, a, a small check, sometimes, I mean, I don't think they've ever rained. They, they don't, nowadays, they don't exceed, they've never gotten a 200, but they, I will get a little <laughs> check from Rocky. And I laugh because what? How many years are we away from that movie? Twenty uh, some, thirty years. Nineteen nine was it ninety or ninety? No, it was ninety, I believe. Yeah, so we're thirty years away from that movie plus, and then that's <laughs> that's why I tell my son, who's a singer songwriter, but also an actor, has been in a lot of plays and a lot of other performances, but has not done movies yet. I say you got to get in a, a movie series and get a starring role because you'll 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 enjoy getting checks fifteen twenty years later. <laughs> that's as good as an ira or a uh, pension <laughs> yeah i haven't exactly gotten rich off it but it's but it's <laughs> funny every time i get one of these little checks i laugh all right joined here <laughs> by the uh, future egot uh, award winner hal bernstein as he's a uh, a man of stage and screen uh here on the sports narrative go ahead darren well uh we're going to transition real quick. Do you have any up and coming heavyweights that you're uh, following that you think have huge futures right now? Uh, heavyweights. Oh boy. Um, you know, the heavyweight division is, well, you know, uh, I was, Jared Anderson is, is yes. somebody that I think has the skill set. You know, you do, we just saw him against limited opposition on the Fury Wilder card, but I think he's a fighter who under the right circumstances could be a player in the heavyweight division. You know, he's got lots of power, uh, delivers his punches well, and can throw some combinations. So he's a fighter to watch. Now, have you followed uh, our official prospect on the Eating Leather podcast, Xander Zayas, uh, Puerto Rican, uh, just jumped up from Walter Way, 10 and 0, 7 KOs. Uh, amazing. He's got Felix Trinidad Part 2 written all over him. I'm yeah, a he's a very talented the, uh... young fighter. Yeah, he's a talented fighter. I haven't, you know, dug into him because I haven't really announced his fights, but but watching him fight, he's very talented. Well, hopefully one day he'll uh, make it over to Showtime and start making some big money and he'll get a chance to uh, commentate. <laughs> well, I'd love it. It'd be fun for me because I'd like to commentate his fights for sure. He just has that killer instinct. That, that's what you see up yeah. close and personal. You can just tell when a guy's got a guy hurt, he's got that killer instinct. He'll go after you. He's not afraid. So he is our yeah, official sure. prospect. Did you get yeah. to see uh, Edward Berlanga the other day? Uh, kind yeah, of, I uh, did. Uh, I, yeah, I, I watched that. I was there for that fight. And uh, he was, uh, you know, um, I think – uh, he, like, he did suffer an injury in the fight, which probably hampered him a little bit, but also demonstrated that, you know, he he's not yet ready for the top 168 pounders, despite his remarkable knockout streak. You know, he has some, still some things to clean up defensively before he's going to be ready for the top people in that division. As they say in Saturday Night Live, he's not ready for prime time yet. That The bloom is off the rose a little bit, but we'll see if he can bounce back uh, after that bicep injury. Right. Yeah, well, thank sure. you so much, sir, for uh, hopping on with us. We can't thank you enough. Good to be Wait, with you. That I, was got, fun. I, got, I got another question here real quick. Oh, yeah. Just I'm sorry. As, as we talk about the um, kind of how boxing weathered through the pandemic and, you know, what Top Rank did with the bubble there at, at MGM and and 
it, you know, it, it seems like it's kind of found some new footing and, and found a new place where, where it's getting a little bit of that revitalization and obviously having some top right heavy, uh, top rank heavyweights helps as well. Um, how do you think boxing weathered the, the, the pandemic and, and where do you think it's going to go going forward? Well, I think that a lot of the sports came back better from the pandemic than people thought they would, both in terms of the product uh, and the way it kind of the sports persevered. And boxing was an example of it. You know, uh, yeah. Top Rank led the way with their bubble. And then we did our bubble at the Mohegan Sun uh, yeah. during the course of that for months. And the fights that were put on in the sport in 2020, in 2020, were pretty good uh, you know they, at first they couldn't quite make them at the big matches that they wanted to but then it, they did and this year has been a superb year so i think boxing there's no one running all of boxing so it wasn't probably a collective decision but individually everyone involved in the sport figured out that if we're going to get past this moment uh, in a good way, we have got to really do our best. And they have, you know, this has been the best yeah. year 2021 for the, the actual product the sports put out in the last five or six years. Uh, and um, so I think it, it augurs well for that sport moving forward. It's now seen on enough platforms worldwide. Uh, uh, Fox just picked up their fourth year of boxing, which is good. Uh, it's on many platforms and so people have a chance to see it and for the most part uh, the sport is putting out good matches do you think you'll see that level of cooperation uh, I mean we've always had the the fights about oh who's gonna fight who and and you know we always had the different different camps that would you know argue about money or location or whatever do you think we're gonna finally see that era of cooperation and and kind of getting to that place where where the big fights that people want to see, they'll actually get to see. Well, some of them do come to fruition even now, but some don't. And right. I think what we need is, and then ironically, even though we criticize the organizations that run boxing and rightfully so, <laughs> they sometimes now are being a force for good by forcing fights to happen. Like uh, Sean Porter and uh, Terrence Crawford's a perfect example. And then the promoters kind of have to fall in line. So I think we will see the, the different promotional camps and uh, let's be honest, some of the platforms that, that fighters are on have a vested interest in them as well. So we just saw ESPN and Fox combined for a pay-per-view and uh, along, while PBC and Top Rank combined for it. Uh, right. We're going to see the Crawford Porter fight. There, you, know, uh, you know, Canelo was not, with the same promotional company he was an independent and he decided to fight plant so uh there's a, there's more of that happening yeah i think that's fantastic for the sport going forward i think the streaming yeah. platforms and all of that and and anytime we can get more al bernstein we are always blessed so okay, well thank you very much i appreciate you guys visiting it's, it's fun we'll do it again absolutely anytime thank al. you sir what an take honor bye-bye